the title for today is, Are You Safe Safely in God's Purpose? Are we safely in God's purpose? Acts 28, 11 to 31. And I'm really sad we're finishing up Acts because I've really enjoyed this. I've loved, loved preaching through Acts. But the, the whole focus, I hope you found it very encouraging because the whole focus is no matter what we're going through in our life, we can live in victory. We can still live in victory through our faith in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's really the whole focus. I hope that has been encouraging to you that no matter what's going on in our life, no matter what's going on in our church, no matter what's going on in our country, in our world, we can still live in victory. We can still have peace and joy. We can still live in God's purpose. We can live in victory through our faith in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And Acts is an amazing story, <clears throat> an amazing story my water here. Against all odds, Christianity not only survives, but it thrives. I mean, if you think about it, what we started out with the book of Acts, there, Jesus has this motley crew, you know, mostly fishermen and tax collectors and, you know, all kinds of people that you wouldn't normally pick to be your, your top guns, right? He picks his motley crew, and what happens? The, the, the treasurer gets hanged, he hangs himself, the treasurer Judas. The Peter, the fearless leader, denies Jesus, says, I don't even know the guy, right, three times. They're all in hiding. Jesus is, is executed. They're all in hiding. That's the only thing these guys were really good at was hiding, all right? They're hiding. Jesus shows up and says, I'm alive. Wait till Easter a couple weeks from now. I'm alive, but I'm leaving again. Now go change the world. That's what he did with these, these, these losers, right? You feel like a loser, you're in good company. You're in good company. We are in good company. Then we saw what happened in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit falls on the apostles and falls on the, the New Testament church, right? And it explodes. In the first century alone, there weren't many people on earth compared to now. In the first century alone, there were one million converts to Christianity. One million new believers in the first century alone. Do you ever feel like your life is a mess, like you can't accomplish something, like you just can't move forward, like you're stuck, you know, last week, you can't do it? Well, guess what? You're right. You can't do it. We cannot do it, but God can through the power of his Holy Spirit, through the power of his Holy Spirit. And I hope that we have grasped that from this book, and I hope this drives it home today. Father, we just thank you for the worship. We thank you for those who are here live and those who are live streaming today. We know that there's no accident that we're hearing this. That your Holy Spirit has a purpose for our life. That you want to do something in our heart today. We pray that your Holy Spirit would move in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we have been saw the five S's, Acts 27 and 28, five S's, right? Paul sails for Rome, right? And then they hit the storm, good. And then there was a shipwreck, good, we're doing great. And then they were... Stranded, yeah, stranded on the island, right, Gilligan's Island. And then, and now today, we are going to see they are safely in Rome. Did you get it? I got saved. Saved, saved, good, right, they were saved. They, Paul is safely in Rome. Let's read, I'll read the passage first of all. I guess I'll read it off of the monitor here. So starting with verse 11, <clears throat> after three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island, and it was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there three days. From there we set sail and arrived at Re Regium. The next day the south wind came up, and on the following day we reached Patioli. There we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a, a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. 
When we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Three days later, he called together the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, we have not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of our people who have come from there have reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we have... We know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through the Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will, ever, you will be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Wow. Here we go. Paul is safely at Rome. Safely at Rome. Some safety. He's chained to a Roman soldier, right? He's, he's chained 24 hours a day. He had to be chained. They would work in shifts. They'd chain themselves to him. Chained to a Roman soldier waiting for a trial before Caesar. It'd be like, you know, the president, right? And, and he will finally, we're going to talk about this next week when I do a bridge from Acts to the book of Romans. We're going to do a bridge, and we're going to see he will finally be released, actually, from this imprisonment. But he, then he will go on a mission trip and write more books of the Bible, and then he's going to be rearrested and brought back to Rome. And at that, that point, he's going to be beheaded. Paul was beheaded by the Roman emperor and his henchmen. But still, Paul, I still say he is safely in God's will and purpose. Both times. Both this time when he's going to be released, he was safely in God's purpose and will. He was called there. Remember, he's called to Rome. But even when he's beheaded, he's still in God's purpose. Safely in the purpose. Both times. We are safer if we are in if we are in God's will and purpose, we are safe as anywhere we could be. If you are in God's will and purpose, wherever you are, even in a battlefield, even if, say, you're in the Ukraine and you're helping take supplies like Tima, who we've been supporting and praying for, like Tima, he is safer there in the Ukraine with all those missiles flying down. We are, he is safer there than we are in our hot tub here in New Hope. Because if, we, we are, we, we are, if we're in God's will, we're safe. Nothing can touch us without God's permission. And if something does touch us, that means God gave the permission for it. That's what that means. Uh, it, it, there's a purpose in this, a purpose. Uh, when I was a youth pastor, I was a youth pastor for 10 years, and I remember starting an inner city ministry. A lot of you have heard about it. It was, it was dangerous. It was crazy where we were. Uh, it, they finally bulldozed the whole project that we would work in. Uh, I went on mission trips to places that parents were very nervous. I said, I don't know. I'm not going to let my kid go there. That's not safe. And I remember telling the parents all the time, if we are doing God's work and in God's will for his purpose, your kid is safer with me down in the inner city. Your kid is safer with me in another country 
than they are sitting at home playing their video games. They're safer there. We are safer in God's will. Nothing can touch us unless God says it's okay. So we see uh, back to Paul, and he's, he's showing up at Rome. We see the believers greet Paul. They were so excited. He was so excited. He had already written them a letter saying how much he wanted to see them and couldn't wait to see them. What letter was that? Romans. That's what we're going to be doing uh, starting in a couple weeks. The book of Romans. We're going to study that next. He had written in there that he can't wait to see the believers in Rome because he wanted to build them up. And now he gets to spend two years with these very believers that he had written this, this, this letter to the Romans. He, spent, uh, he gets to spend two years with that, these believers and this church. And not only them, he also gets to spend two years with these soldiers who are chained to him, right? <laughs> He's with them, too. It reminds me when we first started the church. Remember, some of, you, some of you might remember, 22 years ago, three years ago, we had lots of protesters, uh, you know, so-called you know, tolerant people trying to shut us down, and they were trying to come into the church, and they caught all this trouble, and they were threatening us. And we had policemen in the service for the first three months. Every week, I could count on two people there, two policemen. You know, I knew I'd have two people in our church. So, uh, but that's what we had. And now it's happening all over the country. But this was back 23 years ago. It was already happening here. And uh, th that reminds me of that. I could always count. The, Paul could always count on two people hearing his message, uh, one person, three a day, hearing his message, the soldiers that were chained to him, right? And, but he also gets to spend this time with these, new, these believers and the, the new believers and, and the, uh, the, the church there, that was God's sovereign plan for him to be chained in Rome with a chance to witness and, and share his faith with all the people in Rome that were coming, the Jews and the Gentiles that are coming to hear about Jesus Christ and also the new Christians in the church there. It was a young church. He got to ground those believers. He got to disciple them. He got to lay a real foundation with those believers in those two years. That was God's purpose for Paul. And, but then Paul focuses, while he's there, we saw the passage, he focuses on the Jews in Rome. That was a huge mission field. In Paul's time, at one point, all the Jews were expelled from Rome by the emperor, but they had come back in, they were back in again, and there were about 40,000 Jewish people in Rome at this time. And look what happens. Some listened to him, and I'm going to read it here, some listened to him, but most didn't. Where have we seen that before? Over and over in the book of Acts, we have seen Paul witnessing. And, and some of the Jews would believe, but the majority would not believe. There's always a remnant all through the way. We, we studied this all the, the way through. We see that, that this would keep on happening. And Paul makes the point he, that this was fulfilling prophecy. In fact, in Acts 28, verse 24, I'm going to read it again. This fulfills prophecy. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Once again, over and over again, there's a remnant that believes, even like today, there's a whole remnant of Jewish people that believe that are coming to Christ. Lots of people in our church were, were, are, are Jewish, uh, Jewish Christians, right? And they're, they're completed Jews, they're fulfilled Jews, right? But then it says, verse 25, they disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through the prophet, Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will, you will be ever seeing but never perceiving, for this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, they have, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. And we see that this fulfilled a prophecy. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that when the Messiah came, the majority of the Jewish people would not receive him because their hearts had become callous. They had closed their, their ears. They had shut their eyes. And so God says, fine, you're going to stay that way. I'm going to send the Messiah to the Gentiles. And after the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled, I'm going to open your eyes once again. But, but the prophet Isaiah prophesied that very thing. People say, why, why do Jewish people don't accept the Messiah? It was prophesied. God said that was what was going to happen. And not only God through the prophet Isaiah, but then Jesus repeated that very exact prophecy he repeated that same thing when the, when the Pharisees were turning the people against them and the, most of the Jews were rejecting him. He repeated that very 
prophecy. It was prophesied. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, predicted that the majority would reject the Messiah. But there has always been a remnant. In Jesus' day, there was a, a remnant. You talk about the, the first church was Jewish. All the believers were, Jew, were Jewish. There were no Gentile believers until they were scattered. Remember, we saw that in Acts 4. They were scattered to the Gentiles, right? But it was, there's always been a, a remnant. And that prophecy will hold. It was prophesied that it would hold until the second coming. And that's the pattern that we've seen all throughout these 2,000 years. The majority of Jews reject Jesus, but there's always a remnant that does believe him. But finally, that prophesied that when Jesus comes again, at the second coming, the surviving remnant is going to embrace Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes again, there's only going to be a remnant lie because most of the Jews are going to be killed by the Antichrist and, and, and persecution. But they're going to, the remnant that is left is going to turn to Jesus Christ and embrace Jesus Christ. At the time when Armageddon, when the armies of, of the world are coming against Israel, can we see that happening? You better believe you can see it happening now, right? Jesus is going to return and save them. Jesus Christ will come and save them. In fact, I'm just going to read this passage. It's powerful. Powerful. In Zechariah 12, verse 1, it says this. This is the word of the Lord concerning Israel, the Lord who stretches out the heaven, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the spirit of man within him, declares, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be... be Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. On that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, Armageddon, right? I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. On that day, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over the house of Judah, but I will blind all the horses of the nations. Then the leaders of Judah will say in their hearts, the Lord of Jerusalem, I'm sorry, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. On that day, I will make the leaders of Judah like a fire pot and a wood pile, like a flaming torch among the sheaves. They will consume left and right all the surrounding peoples, but Jerusalem will remain intact in her place. Read the book of Revelation if you want to see this fulfilled. Verse 7, the Lord will save the dwellings of Judah first so that the whole honor of the house of David and of Jerusalem's inhabitants may not be greater than that of Judah. That on that day, the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them will be like David and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. On that day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. This is the battle of Armageddon. The final judgment. Now here we go. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn. The remnant will look on the one they have pierced. Who is that? Jesus Christ. And he's coming down now to save them, to rescue all of Israel. And they're going to turn to him in mass, completely turn to Jesus Christ. The whole remnant will turn to Jesus. But until then, the majority, is that powerful? But until then, the majority of Jews will reject the Messiah. It breaks my heart. My Jewish friends, I pray for them. I witness to them. I just can't, I just hope they put their faith in Jesus Christ. But the majority will reject the Messiah as Messiah, as, as Isaiah said, as Jesus Christ said, and now as Paul slams the exclamation point on it. But notice something about Paul's ministry here. It's very interesting. Paul was not seeker sensitive. <laughs> he was not, churches all want to be seeker sensitive now, right? He was not seeker sensitive. The church in the USA today, their main goal, I've been to a lot of training seminars, uh, never offend anybody. Never offend anybody. That's the whole goal. Preach carefully. Leave anything out in the Bible that's going to upset somebody. Don't say it. 
because you want everybody to come and, and be happy, right? Uh, skip anything offensive. Pre the pe pastors, I, they're my friends and I can't take it anymore. They, they preach carefully. They won't they'll skip anything offensive. And as a result, what they preach is a false gospel. They're preaching a false gospel. They're telling people you can believe anything you want and live any way you want and you can still be a Christian. That's what they're telling people by not telling them what the Bible really says. They're preaching a false gospel and they produce fake believers. Fake believers. They're not real believers. They're fake believers. They, they haven't heard the full gospel. They haven't heard the word of God fully. So they're accepting something that's not that's not real. They've been inoculated to the true gospel. And as a result, most of these fake believers are conformed to the world. They live just like the world, think just like the world. They don't have a biblical worldview. You, saw, you know, I heard the last thing that Barna said. Only 6% of people in the United States have a biblical worldview. They actually believe the Bible and everything has to go through God's word. Only 6%. But if half the country thinks they're Christians and only 6% have a biblical worldview, what does that tell you about the 44%? Fake. Deceived. They've been self-deceived. They, 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 don't, they don't get that. But, but Paul d was not seeker-sensitive. He preached the truth. Speak the truth in love. We have to speak the truth in love. Paul was Holy Spirit sensitive, not seeker sensitive, Holy Spirit sensitive. That's what we're called to be as pastors. That's what we're called to be as Christians, Holy Spirit sensitive. He preached the truth. He followed the Holy Spirit's leading no matter where it went. He followed that. And if Acts 28, 28, he says, therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been, been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. He, he went with the Holy Spirit's leading. Are we Holy Spirit sensitive. Or even if it means sounding intolerant, even if it makes us unpopular, even if it makes, even if it makes our church shrink, are we, are we Holy Spirit sensitive? Are, 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 we, are we doing that? Do we follow the Holy Spirit? Do we look for the open doors just like Paul did? He, he tried the, the, the Jews and then he went to the Gentiles. He was following the open door, the Holy Spirit's leading. And, and when, we, when we follow the Holy Spirit's leading, are we looking for God's open doors? Are we ready with God's word, ready with God's word to share that? I, I hear people all the time uh, say things that are not biblical. And, and we ha I have, I'm always trying to be ready with the word of God. I hear people say one of the most common ones is God's going to let everybody into heaven. There's a thinking out there in America. That's the American religion, right? Uh, God, the American Christian, God's going to let everybody in heaven. The Pope said it this week. The Pope. He, now, I remember growing up, the Pope said everybody's going to hell, you know, but now, now the, the, the newest Pope is, has gone the, the other way. You know, he, he's like, you know, everybody's going to heaven. Did you see that, Pope Francis? Everybody's going to heaven. You're all going to go to heaven. Doesn't matter. God, the, the, God's gonna, Jesus is going to catch everybody before they, they hit hell. Uh, every, everybody, he, even Judas, I think he mentioned Judas, he was going to even go to heaven. It was cr crazy because that completely contradicts what Jesus said. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And my good Catholic friends believe that, by the way. When I'm out in the streets doing our, our pro-life ministries and trying to save the babies, you know, that every one of them believes Jesus is the, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. They don't fall for this. This is what I call an apostate pope. Uh, they don't fall for that. It, it, Jesus is the only way. It, whenever it, if people have, you know, they, they come up with this false gospel, like, we're all going to heaven. I always come back with John 14, 6. I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I just keep saying it. I just keep saying this. And that's where we have to be. I don't know if you saw in the news this week, but there was an NCAA, double, NCAA wrestler comes under fire. Did you see the wrestler from Penn State? Penn State wrestler Aaron Brooks won his third consecutive individual NCAA title on Saturday. Brooks' win helped Penn State finish first place. They took first in the nation for their 10th team title. Brooks also has three Big Ten titles on his resume. The 22-year-old put his belief in Jesus Christ at the forefront after winning the title. He talked about his faith had helped him win the victory. It's everything. Christ's resurrection is everything, Brooks said after the, the match. 
But not just his life, his death, and his resurrection. You can only get that through him. You can only get that through him. The Holy Spirit only through him, through Jesus. It's the only way. No false prophets. No Mohammed or anyone else. Woo! Here we go. Only Jesus Christ himself. He said the Holy Spirit was everything to him. He could be preaching through Acts for us, couldn't he? And pointed out a verse from the Bible that helped him. They didn't mention the verse. I'm, it's probably John 3, 16. I'm blessed. God used me. He gave me this platform for this right here. It's all for his glory. Amen. Powerful, right? And the press just raved about him, and they just fawned over him, and, and the president called him and congratulated him. No, he hit, it hit the fan, you know, it hit the fan, man. But he spoke the truth. He spoke the truth. It hit the fan. It, 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 you know, it, but he's not backing down. He didn't issue an apology. He didn't say, oh, I was wrong. I shouldn't have, blah, blah. No, he, he is not backed down one inch. Not one inch. Because he spoke the truth. We, I'm not saying we're off to be quite as bold as this guy, but we got to speak the truth. I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I, people are constantly constantly under deception. I, there's more Christians, I, people who claim they're Christians, talk to me and they make a mistake with us. They say, well, I'm a Christian, but I think X, Y, and Z is still okay. Fill in the blank, right? I'm a Christian, but I still think that's okay. I'll give, I'll give you a slam dunk. Uh, this is one I hear so often. I'm a Christian, but I still think abortion's okay. Now listen, you know, I, know, I talk about God's mercy and grace, Many people in our church have been part of an abortion in some way, whether mom or dad. And, and you know, God's grace is there. Once you pray and ask for forgiveness, it's gone. This, I'm, not, <clears throat> I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about someone who says, I'm a Christian, but I think it's okay to have an abortion or okay for other people to have an abortion. It's okay. And I always say, uh, that's impossible. There's no way you can think that. You, there's no way that you as can say, I'm a Christian, but I think abortion is okay. It's impossible. Because in John 8, 31, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Hear that? If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. That, the teaching is God's word. Everything that Jesus said, and believe me, he's all against killing. All against killing a baby, that's way over the line. You know, we talked about that child sacrifice. You've been here with me. You know what I'm talking about? Thou shalt not kill. Uh, crazy. And I said to someone, if you think you're a Christian and you think abortion's okay, you're deceiving yourself. You're under self-deception. It's impossible. The very best you could say is you're a, you're a, a, a conformed to the world Christian who's fallen under Satan's deception. That's the best you can say. But I'm, I'm, I'm saying you cannot have the Holy Spirit in you and affirm abortion. It's impossible. But then I go right to the next thing. But you can be saved. You can become a real Christian. You can be forgiven for whatever you've thought or done or whatever it is. I just use one example there. You can get the Holy Spirit. You can have the Holy Spirit because to, uh, if you hold my teaching or my disciples, verse 32 says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Verse 36, Jesus said, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free Indeed, even if you've even if you've been bought the deception that you're a Christian and you can do these things, you bought the lie. You think you're gonna good enough to go to heaven. You think everybody's going to heaven. Whatever lie, you can still be saved. You can receive the Holy Spirit because in John three sixteen, back it up a little bit. In John three sixteen, it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you will repent of your past sins and believe in Jesus Christ, his death on the cross in our place, his resurrection from the dead to give us a brand new life, the power to live a new life. If you will put your faith in Jesus, you can become a Christian. You can be forgiven of everything. You can be set free. You will receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Are we have we ever done that? Have we ever put our faith in Jesus? I'll come back to that in just a few moments. Are we Holy Spirit sensitive? Are we living by the power of the Holy Spirit? Are we living in victory? Are we living in victory in our, our spiritual life? Are we safely in God's purpose? 
Are we safely in God's purpose? And this is not measured by safety. If we are safely in God's purpose, it's not measured by safety. Look at Paul. He's chained. He's going to be beheaded. It's measured by the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's how we measure if we're safely in God's purpose is the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our life and as it's pouring out to other people. Are we safely in that? Are we staying in God's purpose? Are we staying in God's purpose? Are we persevering no matter how rough it gets, no matter how lonely we get? Yeah, no matter how isolated we are. If we're a true Christian, we're isolated, right? We're isolated no matter how isolated. We, you, you may be the only true Christian at your workplace. You may be the only true Christian in your school grade, in your, in your, in your class at school. You may be the only one at your college. You may be the only one. You may be the only true Christian on the team that you're on. You may be the only Christian in your family or even in your church. There's a lot of churches where there's only a few true Christians. I've seen them. I've, I've had, well, I'm not going to get into details on that. Connect the dots. There's ch whole churches where there's no only a couple of true Christians. It's crazy. And, and sure, some in your, wherever you are, work or school or whatever, they may claim to be Christian, but it's, it's not real faith. And they're not really living it. Or if they are, you don't even know if they're Christian because they're undercover Christians. There's so many undercover Christians. You know, there's a lot of undercover. I'm a Christian, but I just don't tell anybody. I don't want anybody to know it. You know? I don't want to lose something, lose popularity, lose some, something. I, so at work, don't want to lose that promotion. Don't want to lose that raise, right? And so we're undercover Christians, which, well, we'll let, we'll let you figure that one out if that's real or not. But will we persevere in God's purpose even if we're alone? Even if we're alone, will we persevere? And you're going to see why I'm setting this up for this. Even if we're alone, will we persevere? One of the best examples of this I learned recently through an ant. Do an aunt. Uh, I probably wonder why I brought this in. Laurel, my youngest daughter, wanted an ant farm. She's desperate for an ant farm. She wants pet ants. She wants pet everything, as you know. But she really wanted pet ants. So I went online and I found this, this ant farm. Isn't this cool? It's, it, it, it's blue goo. I call it blue goo. But it's, it, you plug a light in and there's this blue gel. And, and it's what they use to send the ants up into space with. And then they come back again, and it has enough food and water in it, and, and then they study the ants and all that. And so I, I got this, and I plugged it in, and we got ants, harvester ants online, I don't know, 25 or 50, I can't remember how many. There's a lot of ants. We poured them in. They start digging through the blue goo, and, and they're having a great time, and, and they're digging, and they're making their tunnels. And, and it was fun for about a a day, and then she's on to the next pet, right? You know, but she, you know, I'd plug it, and we look, and it was fun. Guy Allen liked it. I would always send a guy the latest update on my, on my blue goo ants. And, uh, and so, but then they start to die, because ants don't live forever, and I'm not putting new ones in. It was winter time, and, and they start dying off. And, and after about a month, half of them were dead, and then after another month, almost all were dead. Pretty soon, there's only like three or four ants in there. They're still working, and they're burying the dead ones, and I would scoop them out. I'd open up the top and scoop out the dead ants and, you know, bury them for real. And, and uh, so then all of a sudden, there's only a couple ants, and they're, they're in there, and then there's only two ants. And, and all of a sudden, there's only one ant, and that one ant buried the other ones. He, he would take them down deep in the hole, and he buried them, and I would try to get them out, the one I couldn't get out. And, and he just kept going. And, and, and then I'd get up the next morning thinking he's going to be dead. He's still there, and he's still there. Long, a month after the last ant died, he is still going. And then I see him starting to stagger. I know he's starting to weaken, but he's staggering around in there. I'm like, no, no, don't. And I named him Methuselah, Ant. Methuselah, Ant. yeah, Methuselah. I was the oldest man in the Bible, 900 some years old. Right, so I called him Methuselah because he just wouldn't die, you know? And I was all excited every day. I'd check in on him. And Laurel didn't care anymore, but I was checking on him. I go, here he is, Laurel Methuselah. You know, she didn't care. So anyway, uh, so the guy did. I kept sending it to the guy. I kept sending guy pictures and, and stuff. And so finally, one day, he wasn't there. He had crawled down to the very deepest part of the tunnel where there's a tiny little tunnel and he buried himself at the very bottom. But that ant showed me something. He never quit. He was like the Martian by himself, you know, the astronaut in the Martian, totally by himself. No, no one else, around. but he kept being faithful. He kept digging and he kept doing what he was supposed to do. And I was like, you know what? 
That's like what Jesus said. Will I find faith? Will I find faith on the earth when I return? Will people keep being faithful? Will anybody still have the faith when I return? And we will we perse persevere in God's purpose for our life? Will we persevere? Don't let me forget that. I'm going to put more ants in it soon. All right. So will we persevere in God's purpose for our lives? I'm going to tell you a sad story of somebody who didn't persevere. I'm going to end with this, actually. Someone who did not persevere, someone who quit. It's connected to Acts 28, which we're studying, believe it or not. In Acts 28, while Paul was under this house arrest, chained to this soldier, he wrote a letter to the church in Colossae. And it's in the, the book is Colossians 4, uh, verse 14. And listen to what he says here. Our dear friend Luke, now you know Luke, he wrote the book of Luke, and he wrote the book of Acts, right? Our dear friend Luke the doctor and Demas send greetings, all right? So here he's writing from Rome to the church in Colossae, and he writes this very thing. Then in Philemon, we see in Philemon, verse 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. He's writing all this from Rome. All right, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, from Rome here in Acts 28. This is where he is, okay? But then Paul was imprisoned again. He got loose. He did his big mission trip. He wrote lots more letters that we now have in our Bible. Uh, but he's imprisoned again, and this time there's great danger. This time he's not going to escape, as we're going to see next week. He, this is a lot more dangerous time. And, but look what he writes in 2 Timothy 4.10. He writes in 2 Timothy 4.10, in his, this next imprisonment, he says, For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Demas loved this world and deserted Paul. And more importantly, and more sadly, he, de he, he deserted Jesus Christ. He left his faith behind. Where was Demas? He disappeared. He was sucked in by the world. He was conformed to the world. Conformed to the world. We don't know where Demas ultimately ended up. We know he started out in Thessalonica, but he just disappears from history. But we do know Luke. We kept seeing Luke was listed with Demas. We know where Luke was with Paul till the end. And now we know all about Luke. He wrote the book of Acts that we just preached through. But it's sad, but... It's sad to read this, but I've seen this happen so many times in 35 years of ministry. I've seen this happen so many times in this church. So many have backslidden, have started out on fire, have witnessed and been baptized and, and led, people, led ministries. And, but then they sometimes they'll move, and, and that once they move, they just never find that church, and they kind of fade, their faith fades away. Or, or they, they, while they're here, they start to fall back into some old stronghold in their life, something that God has set them free. Maybe they had a drinking problem, and they fall back into alcohol. All of a sudden, they're drinking. I'm like, what are you doing? You, you were finally set free from your addiction to alcohol, and you're, you've gone back to it. You know, the alcoholism, the addictive sin. Some of them gone back to smoking pot. They've been free of from pot for years, and now it's legal. I can smoke it. No, it was an addiction for you. It was an addictive sin. It's, drugs are, no matter if it's legal or not, they're, they're destructive. Destructive. Uh, it, it, and they'll fall back into a sexual sin, you know, that they've been free. They'll lose their marriages and, and just, just implode, lose their marriages. Just so many sad stories heartbreaking stories, people that oh, shared their testimony and now aren't anywhere near the Lord, completely lost their faith, or, or cold, as, cold as a fish, you know, it, spiritually. It said, will we finish well? Will we fulfill God's purpose for our lives? God has a purpose for every one of our lives. Will we fulfill God's purpose for our life? And there's only one way you're going to be able to do that. And it's, I hope you will never forget what we have seen in the book of Acts. It's through our faith in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the only way you're going to persevere. Any one of us could fall off the horse at any time, right? We could all crash any time if we are in the flesh, if we're trying to do it in our own power. It has to be faith in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Every day, every day I hope you wake up and I hope you take this home after two and a half years of the book of Acts, hearing this over and over again. I hope that the first thing you will say every morning is, I can live in victory. 
I can live in victory through faith in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. I hope that you just keep saying that every morning. Start off that way because it's guaranteed. There are so many promises in God's word that guarantee this. Every time you get hit, every time I get hit, we have to do something very important. We have to quote God's word. Remember Jesus in the wilderness? He's getting attacked by Satan in the flesh, right? And, and Satan's attacking him, well, in the spirit. But, in, you know, Satan's right there with him, and he's after him. And, and every time, what did Jesus do? It is written. He quoted the word of God. And finally, after the third time, Satan fled from him. The word of God. And we, that's what we have to, to quote God's promises. One I'm locked in on right now. You can steal this from me if you want. In Acts 2, 9 and 10, I just can't get off of this one. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And here we go. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Every time I get hit now, the last couple of weeks I've been locked in on this one. I say, I just say it's so powerful. I say, I have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Every time I'm hit, temptation, discouragement, whatever it is, I have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. And claim your verse. Claim that Whatever promise, write them down, memorize them, meditate them, claim them. But the first step before you can do that, the first step you can do, do that is you have to put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's the first step. Before you can have this spiritual power, before the Holy Spirit will come into you, we have to put our faith in Jesus Christ. There has to be a time when we say, God, I believe Jesus died for my sin. I repent of that old life. I walk away from that. I ask for forgiveness. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I put my trust, my hope in Jesus Christ. His death on that cross to wash me clean. His blood to wash me clean. I put my faith in Jesus. I give my life to him. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Let's pray. How is God speaking to us right now? Wherever you are, you might be driving your car, you might be at the beach, you might be sitting right here. How is the Holy Spirit speaking to us? Maybe you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. You're not a Christian yet. Maybe you even thought you were, but you know now that you're not really a Christian yet. But you can do that right now. Now is the day of salvation. You can put your faith in Jesus this very second. Right where you are, wherever you are, you can put your faith in Jesus right now. The simple prayer of faith, it happens in our heart, but I always encourage people to say a simple prayer just to put an exclamation on it and to be sure of it. But the simple prayer of faith that, God, I repent of anything in my life that goes against your word that goes against the words of your son, Jesus Christ. I ask you to forgive me. Because I'm putting my faith in Jesus. My hope, my trust in Jesus. His death for my sin. His resurrection for my new life. I put my faith in Jesus. I give my life to you, God.
if you have put your faith in Jesus, you're in for the shock of your life because the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit is now in you. Has now transformed you into a new creation. Therefore, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Your life will never be the same. You will read the Bible and, 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 the, and the words will jump out like fire now. You'll be able to understand things that you never understood before because the Holy Spirit is teaching you God's word. You will be convicted. Things that you used to think or do, you will be convicted. You will sense the Spirit convicting your heart, saying, no more. You can't do that. You can't think that anymore. You belong to Jesus Christ. You will have power to stand against things that used to knock you down. You will now have spiritual power to keep standing by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you, if you've put your faith in Jesus, to let somebody know. Maybe you have a family member who's a Christian who's been praying for you and sharing faith with you. Maybe someone at school, maybe someone at work. Maybe me, tell me, tell me today. Let somebody know today. Once again, I always give my email, nhcc at comcast.net. Send me an email so I can be excited. We'll be excited for you and help you grow in your faith. And for those of us who are already Christians, commit to saying every day, starting the day, I can live in victory through faith in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then claim your promises. Safely in God's purpose. God, I pray that you would fulfill your purpose in every life here and out there that's hearing this. You will fulfill your purpose for our lives through the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that in Jesus' name, amen.